What would you do if you knew an earthquake was about to hit? A new system called ShakeAlert warned about 21,000 people near Santa Rosa. Earthquakes are devastating, but they are something we can predict to a certain extent today because we understand them. But there was a time when no one could explain the phenomenon. All it was was a jolt that would cause mass destruction. Well, until one man took it upon himself to figure it out. Andrew Lawson Andrew Lawson was a geologist who started his scientific career over a century ago, when earthquakes were seen as nothing more than an inconvenience to the natural world. Pretty wild, considering the damage they could do. But Lawson was one of the few scientists who believed that these seismic events could be related to something going on underneath the Earth's surface. Lawson wasn't really a man to let things go either, so he started looking into it. And that's when he stumbled upon something huge. In 1890, Lawson joined the faculty of the University of California and started studying the geology around San Francisco. 30 years earlier, another geologist named Josiah Whitney had described the intrusion of granite into Miocene sediments in the coastal ranges south of San Francisco. So it gave Lawson something to work with, but when Lawson examined the sediments, he didn't find any evidence of heating or alteration. None at all. Instead, he noticed something strange. The boundary between the granite and sediments was perfectly straight and ran along one side of a long valley. But that wasn't all. He found out that the sediments are younger than the granite. This means that they should be on top, right? But they're not. They're below the granite. So he reasons that the sediments must have dropped down when the granite moved up, which would take significant activity under the Earth's surface. These things just don't happen out of nowhere. That's when Lawson realized that he had discovered a fault where the granite and sediments had slid past each other and he named it the San Andreas Fault after the valley where he found it. Now, get this. Lawson had no idea how significant his discovery was at the time. It wasn't until a decade later, when the 1906 earthquake devastated San Francisco, that people realized the true magnitude of what Lawson had found. Lawson's report on his discovery suggested that the sediments must have dropped down while the granite moved up but he didn't find any evidence of vertical movement like offset rock layers. Nonetheless, he gave what he believed to be a reasonable interpretation of what he saw at the time. But here's where things get really interesting. The San Andreas Valley ran obliquely across the coastal ranges and was aligned with another long valley, Crystal Springs. Now, that's not how things usually work in nature. Rivers and valleys typically run away from mountain crests not diagonally across them. So to say that things started getting really weird would be an understatement. It was like the deeper Lawson went with his discoveries, the more complicated everything got. Plus, Lawson had no explanation for this particular feature, but it was clear that something was up. And while he may not have realized it at the time, his accidental discovery of the San Andreas Fault changed the way scientists looked at earthquakes forever. And in a way, it all happened overnight too. It was the wee hours of April 18th, 1906, and San Francisco was sound asleep. Suddenly, a powerful earthquake jolted the city for almost a minute, causing chaos and destruction that would be felt for years to come. But that one minute, the entire landscape of the city changed. Buildings crumbled, roads cracked, and the ground opened up, swallowing anything unlucky enough to be in its path. The ensuing fires spread like wildfire, leaving thousands dead, injured, or homeless, and causing hundreds of millions of dollars in damage. Andrew Lawson woke up by the quake, but being in Berkeley, he initially thought the tremors were mild and he waited them out. It wasn't until he saw smoke rising from the direction of San Francisco that he realized the magnitude of the disaster. On one hand, as a citizen, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. On the other, as a scientist, he knew that this was an opportunity to learn more about the earthquake and its causes. Lawson was quick to take action. The day after the quake, he sent a telegraph to Governor George Pardee, who was leading a relief effort in Oakland. In his message, Lawson suggested that the governor form a scientific commission to investigate the quake, which he believed would help ease public anxiety about the disaster. Governor Pardee agreed, and just two days later, 
he announced the formation of a committee of inquiry made up of nine members, including Lawson. For months, the committee worked tirelessly to gather data, interview witnesses, and analyze the evidence. It was integral that they all come together to try to figure out what actually happened that led to such destruction, and if there was anything they could do to keep it from happening again. Lawson, who was considered the leading expert on California geology at the time, was a key member of the committee, and his expertise was crucial to understanding the nature of the earthquake. What was surprising, however, was that Lawson's notoriously short fuse and difficult personality seemed to be left at the door. In fact, he was a model of diplomacy and encouraged his fellow committee members to do their best work. Through his research, he discovered that the quake was caused by the San Andreas Fault, a massive crack in the Earth's crust that runs the length of California. The commission's findings were groundbreaking and laid the foundation for modern earthquake science. It was pretty much the first time that scientists were studying earthquakes and also knew what they were talking about. And boy, did they get specific. The committee's preliminary report, published just six weeks after the quake, was a groundbreaking achievement. Lawson concluded that the earthquake was caused by movement along a fault that stretched almost 200 miles from Point Arena to San Juan Bautista. They found that the quake had a magnitude of 7.9, and that it caused the ground to shift by as much as 28 feet in some places. This was no small feat. It was a major discovery that helped to shape our understanding of earthquakes and plate tectonics for decades to come. But what was even more surprising than the discovery of the fault itself was the direction of movement. Geologists at the time believed that faults were mainly associated with upwards growth of mountains or the downward warping of ocean basins. For earthquakes to be able to cause that kind of change was something that no one was even thinking about at the time. So to say that the discovery was surprising would be an understatement. But that's not all. The movement in 1906 was horizontal, with land west of the San Andreas Fault shifting up to 21 feet to the northwest. It was like every time they took the research one step further, they just ended up with more and more questions. But even then, Andrew Lawson's final report on the San Francisco earthquake of 1906 was a masterpiece of scientific investigation. His research laid out in detail the movement of the fault and the devastation that it wrought on the city. The report was filled with hundreds of photographs and included an atlas that showed the fault's trace and the different degrees of destruction across California. He had taken the minor inconvenience concept of earthquakes and flipped the whole thing around to a point that made it abundantly clear how dangerous it would be to continue life on the San Andreas fault line the way it had been. Changes had to be made. At the end of the report, Lawson made recommendations about rebuilding in an obvious seismic zone, advice that was not taken seriously enough by those in power. Lawson's recommendations called for public buildings, especially schools, to be constructed on firm ground and for other buildings to be thoroughly bonded and well cemented and of honest construction. In a way, he was calling out the construction companies cheaping out on their materials too, which could have also led to doubling up on the effects that took place. But this advice fell on deaf ears. The powerful politicians and businessmen of the city were determined to rebuild San Francisco quickly, and any talk of the earthquake, including building codes, was seen as a hindrance to their goals. They just wanted things to get back to normal and fast, minimizing any questions that might be asked. Governor Party was one of those who downplayed the earthquake's role in the destruction of the city. Just three days after the earthquake, while the city was still burning, he announced to the nation that the destruction was wrought far more by fire than by earthquake. In that one line alone, he shifted the perspective from earthquakes to fires, the pipelines, anything but the unexplainable. The Real Estate Board of San Francisco passed a resolution two weeks later, pledging its members to speak of the disaster as the Great Fire, not the Great Earthquake. It was clear that any discussion of the earthquake was being suppressed, even to the point of rewriting history. This pressure continued for years, and in 1916, when the first statewide geologic map for California was issued, it appeared without earthquake faults not even the San Andreas. 
The powerful interests that control the city and the state were determined to bury the memory of the earthquake, and its seismic consequences were ignored. It would take decades for the importance of Andrew Lawson's work to be recognized fully. In the meantime, San Francisco continued to rebuild, but with buildings that were not designed to withstand earthquakes. It was a recipe for disaster, and people were starting to catch on. It wasn't until 1911 that the first seismology course was offered in the United States, and even then, it was disguised as a geology course. The idea of funding a specific course on earthquakes was just not popular enough, apparently. However, it did not stop scientists from continuing their research. After the 1913 Long Beach earthquake, lawmakers were required to do state inspections of school construction. The earthquakes resulted in several school buildings collapsing, causing many injuries and fatalities. The tragedy sparked public outrage, which finally led to the implementation of state inspections of school construction, not the government's. In 1915, Lawson and a group of like-minded individuals started a degree program in oil exploration and refinery. This was the first time anyone had tried to formally teach the skills required for working in the burgeoning petroleum industry. Lawson was at the forefront of this new field, educating the first generation of petroleum engineers. But that wasn't the end of Lawson's story either. In the 1930s, he was hired to determine the position of the piers for the Golden Gate Bridge. This was a huge undertaking, as the bridge would need to support the weight of heavy vehicles and thousands of pedestrians every day. The first step was to sink a caisson through the sea sediments and into the bedrock. This was a massive engineering feat, and it required a skilled geologist like Lawson to ensure that the bridge would be safe and stable. After the first caisson was sunk, Lawson climbed down into a hundred foot deep shaft to examine the bedrock for himself. When he emerged from the shaft, he was surrounded by engineers and an anxious press. They wanted to know if the bedrock was strong enough to support the bridge. With a twinkle in his eye, Lawson announced, I put my hands on the living rock and it is sound. His confidence in the bedrock was all the assurance the engineers needed to proceed with the project. Thanks to Lawson's expertise, the Golden Gate Bridge was built on solid ground and has stood the test of time. And it's not just the bridge that benefits from his legacy. The petroleum industry he helped create has transformed the world we live in today. It took another decade before the first building code with seismic requirements was approved by the California legislature. This was prompted by an earthquake in Santa Barbara that caused 13 deaths and millions of dollars in damage. It's a shame that it took so long for lawmakers to finally take action, but at least it was a start. Despite Lawson's extensive research and contributions to the understanding of earthquakes and fault movements, it was not until after his death in 1952 that the true nature of the San Andreas Fault would be fully understood. It's taken dozens of earthquakes throughout the world to truly understand what's going on here. In 2016, Thomas Jordan, the director of the Southern California Earthquake Center, made a startling announcement. The San Andreas Fault, which runs along the border of the North American and Pacific tectonic plates, is in a critical state. The southern portion of the fault system has not released a major earthquake since 1857, which means that stresses have been building up for over 150 years. What does this mean for the people of California? It means that the southern portion of the fault is locked, loaded, and ready to go. The last major release of stress occurred in 1906, causing a catastrophic 7.8 magnitude earthquake in the San Francisco Bay Area. This has led to the suggestion that the big one is imminent. When the stress along the southern portion of the fault is finally released, it could be a disaster of unprecedented proportions. The 1994 Northridge earthquake, which caused widespread damage and loss of life, was associated with a separate fault system. So experts believe that the next major earthquake will be even more devastating. Now, before you panic, let's take a look at what we know. The San Andreas Fault, which runs through California, is now one of the most well-known and studied geological features in the world. It's where the Pacific and North American plates meet, and the friction between them has been building up for centuries. We're talking about massive tectonic forces here, people. So, what happens when those forces are unleashed? 
Well, according to the experts at the U.S. Geological Survey, a large earthquake along the southern San Andreas Fault could have devastating consequences. We're talking about a magnitude 7.8 event with a slippage of 2 to 7 meters. To put that into perspective, the last time the southern San Andreas Fault had a significant earthquake was in 1857, and that was estimated to be around 7.9. The damage would be most severe to buildings that are right on the fault, but even those outside of the immediate danger zone would feel the effects. Roads, fiber optic cables, gas pipes and power lines would be severed, leaving the region in chaos. The estimated cost of damage to buildings alone is a staggering $33 billion, with older buildings particularly susceptible. But that's just the beginning. Fires would rage out of control as gas mains and water pipes become severed. In fact, the damage from resulting fires is estimated to be more costly than that from the initial quake. And let's not forget about the aftershocks. That's when the buildings that just happened to be holding on would eventually crumble too. That's because once the main event has destabilized the tectonics of the region, a series of potentially powerful aftershocks could follow, just as they try to stabilize things. In 2011, Christchurch, New Zealand was hit by a 6.2 magnitude earthquake, but the destruction didn't stop there. Since the initial earthquake, the city and surrounding region have experienced more than 10,000 aftershocks. So even the areas that managed to break free during the initial impact were hit after, in a way that none of them could have seen coming. The overall death toll from a large southern San Andreas earthquake is estimated to be in the thousands. It's a scary thought, but Californians are no stranger to earthquakes. The scenario is already pretty dire, but it could be even worse. USGS seismologist Lucy Jones points out that the report's team underestimated the extent of the fire damage from the quake. If the Santa Ana winds were blowing at the time of the quake, it would increase the risk of wildfires. And to make matters worse, the current drought in California has drained the reservoirs that Los Angeles relies on for water. If that quake struck today, water reserves wouldn't last the maximum of six months that they would when full. Once water runs out, there are only days before humans from the area are wiped out. The problem here is that today, while we do understand earthquakes and Andrew Lawson's discoveries and can try to minimize destruction caused, there's no way to make a building 100% safe and no one can truly predict when the big one will strike. So for all we know, it could be today, which just makes everything far scarier than you'd first think. Here lies a question. Would things have been different had it not taken decades for the authorities to acknowledge Andrew's findings? There's a possibility that someone else could have assisted Lawson in his research too, and with the right attention, maybe thousands of lives and billions of dollars could have been saved. But knowing everything we know now, there's still the question of how far the governments are willing to go to hide the truth. Is it possible that what happened to Andrew Lawson is happening to us right now? If the San Andreas fault line is truly locked and loaded, could we just be days from the point that it finally cracks open the earth? That's a question that we might not be able to answer until it's too late. And on that note, we'll wrap up today's video. What's your opinion on the possibility of another massive earthquake headed for San Andreas? Let us know in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos just like this. We'll see you in the next one.